Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, GDPR, What You Need to Know Now. My name is Paul Carley, and I will be your host for today's presentation. In today's session, we'll cover the upcoming General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. We'll discuss how it will impact your business and how to prepare for compliance. Our featured speakers for today are Florin Lazurka, Senior Technical Marketing Manager for Citrix, and joining him is Stephen Tynum, Senior Sales Engineer, also with Citrix. Before we get started, let me cover a few housekeeping details. First, we will have a dedicated Q&A session toward the end of today's event with our panel of experts. We invite you to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. You could do so by entering your question into the Ask a Question window and select Submit on the webinar interface. Second, this event is being recorded and a link to the on-demand version will be sent to everyone in a follow-up email. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Florin to get us started. Florin, Stephen, thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. So the quote that you see on your screen is from our Deputy General Counsel, Robert Feldman. At its core, the GDPR is about trust. It is about the companies handling the personal data of their customers, their partners, and their employees with care and respect. Now, organizations in around the world already trust Citrix to help secure their apps and data in today's mobile cloud and data-driven business environments. As a cloud-based company and service provider, acting as an extension of our customers' IT infrastructure, we're in a unique position to support our customers' GDPR compliance programs. The security built into our solutions and the control they provide over access to applications and data from any device, network, or cloud provide a solid foundation for, the meet, for meeting extensive mandates imposed by, the G, by GDPR. Stephen, can you give us a few more details about the uh, GDPR? Sure. So when we're looking at the GDPR, um, we need to understand that this is a new legal framework that's going to be regulating the personal data of all EU citizens. It's going to replace current EU data directive uh, and also a lot of the existing data protection laws uh, within those EU countries. And it's going to put greater responsibility and accountability onto the companies that are both controllers and processors of data. This is a framework that's going to come in on the 25th of May 2018 and it will affect all countries within the EU, as well as uh, any countries that are dealing with EU citizens' personal data, irrespective of where that company is based. But the biggest change that the GDPR brings to existing data protection laws throughout the EU will be the fact that it gives the public, so individuals, greater control and say on how their personal data is used. And we will go into a bit more of this further on in the presentation. So earlier this year, uh, we had a study commissioned uh, by Citrix with the Ponymon Institute that had a few revelations that although there were organizations aware of uh, GDPR, only about 67% of the respondents were actually aware, and only about half of the organizations have allocated budget and started to prepare for the deadline. Now, the biggest concerns are the potential to levy such large fines, and almost three quarters of the respondents had concerns that complying with the GDPR with, will negatively affect their business. So the GDPR is something to be taken seriously. We're looking at fines of 10 to 20 million euros or two to 4% of the annual worldwide revenues, whichever is greater. Now we're going to look at the principle of privacy by design. So at its very core, privacy by design is to promote uh, the, the privacy and data protection um, from the very start of the project. So this is to make sure that uh, you're taking into account the privacy of individuals' rights and data early on in that project life cycle, and it's always included, as opposed to perhaps uh, later on when a uh, design or a plan is, is hard to change and it becomes a bit of a by-thought. So 
the, with the essence of GDPR is to take that privacy by design approach in, in order to help reduce risk and as we've spoken about already to help build trust between organizations and the individuals whose data they hold. So a key part of the privacy by design is going to be the data protection impact assessments. And what these are going to allow you to do is whenever you take on a new project, maybe introduce a new technology into your organization, you can carry out these assessments and they will help to highlight any potential risks uh, and involvement in personal data. So you can identify these from the very start and make sure that you've always got those uh, as a thought in the design. One of the, um, the biggest changes brought by the GDPR is a 72-hour breach notification. Now, a data breach is more than just being hacked or having data stolen. It's also, it also covers the unauthorized destruction, the loss, the alteration, and disclosure of data, too. So let's look at an example. When we're looking at an example of a hospital, it could be responsible for a personal data breach if the patient's health record is inappropriately accessed due to a lack of appropriate internal controls. So when do individuals have to be notified? It's when a breach is likely to result in a high risk to the rights and the freedoms of individuals. And you must notify those concerned directly. And the high risk means that the threshold for notifying individuals is higher than for notifying the relevant supervisory authority. So one of the bigger changes as well that comes in with the GDPR is the fines that are going to be levied against companies who are seen to be in disregard of GDPR. So it does introduce a two-tier fine, two fine system. So the first tier, which can be 10 million euros or 2% of the company's global turnover, whichever is higher, is for breaches in obligation by the controllers or processors. So this is a lack of compliance and putting the appropriate measures into place. And the more serious of the uh, fines is with the higher 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover. And this is where there have been breaches of the individual's rights and freedoms, which usually equates to loss or destruction of personal data against their wishes. So why are these fines higher in GDPR? But in the past, the powers that uh, sovereign countries have had over data protection have not really had large fines. Uh, to, they haven't really had the ability to impose large fines on organizations that have uh, been in breach of data protection. So a lot of companies have just taken this as part of the risk in involved and seen it as just paying a fine when that fine is levied as opposed to putting in the appropriate technical and organizational methods from the start, so that privacy by design we talked about. So the hope is that under the GDPR, these fines will be significantly higher and companies will no longer be able to take the chance of having a data breach and will hopefully put all the correct technical and organizational methods, measures in place. So let's look at um, the overall GDPR challenges that organizations, including our customers, face. The one is that they must comply or they face penalties. So there's the fine structure that Stephen just talked about, but then we also have uh, recommendations and guidelines and requirements that there must be records of, of uh, processing, right? So keeping, stipulating that organizations need to keep records of data processing, which require um, better insights. And we're also looking at uh, organizations will have to manage multiple data repositories. So we're, this is when we're starting to look at how technology can help against uh, having this data sprawl that we're going to talk about in a few more minutes. So we're going to look at um, organizations encouraged to uh, have the appropriate technical measures to be able to handle privacy for their, their customers' uh, data. 
Stephen, why don't you cover the next few ones for me, please? Yes, no problem. So as we've seen before, breach notification is now mandatory with a, with a 72 hour limit imposed on any data breaches, especially the ones that are going to um, put uh, in danger the individual's rights or freedoms. We've also got the challenge of having to secure the transfer and access of that data to make sure that whether it be to a third party or the individual or other areas within the business that you can safeguard and, and, and securely access personal data. We also have the, the individual's rights. So as we talked about before, the individual has much higher rights now to understand what is happening and control over their data, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And depending on the size of the organization and what type of personal data that organization is processing, you may need to appoint a data protection officer or DPO. And as we discussed before, performing the DPIAs, the, so these data protection assessments as part of your privacy in, by design approach. So as Stephen mentioned, GDPR is about giving control back to individuals. And uh, GDPR is written in a series of articles. And uh, Article 15 talks about the rights of individual to access, address how personal data is being processed, um, and may require user consent via privacy notice. So uh, specifically for this, uh, for this individual, right, it's Article 15, and it says, the data subject shall have the right to obtain from the controller confirmation as to whether or not personal data concerning him is being processed, and what, where that is the case, access to personal data, so seeing w what kind of data is being stored and what kind of data is being collected. We're also looking at the rights of the individual to data portability. So we need to think there about the, the copy and transfer of personal data in a safe and secure manner. This has to be in a, in a format that can be, uh, and they may need to be read by other systems if, if it's been transferred from one system to another, or if the individual themselves has requested to, to uh, have a copy of the data that the, um, the controller or the processor holds on them. Again, you know, these are part of the challenges and the new rights of the individual to be able to you know, securely access that data. So some thought has to be given to how this can be achieved. So something that has probably gotten the most visibility and attention is uh, the right to be forgotten or to erasure. So this is something that you, we've seen about people uh, removing their browsing history or removing their uh, their record online, whether it's searchable in a, in a search engine. Uh, so this one is likely to get more attention in the future as well is, you know, what about, what can, data do you have about me that's being uh, stored and my ability to remove that data from being in, in your hands. Let's now look at how Citrix aids our customers in their GDPR readiness. So when we're looking at GDPR, then we're looking um, at the four points in front that form the, the basis of our approach. Firstly, we have the centralization of apps and data. By centralizing the apps and the data that they're connected to within a data center or cloud, it means we're getting a greater visibility and control on that data so that the data doesn't reside on endpoints. And we're keeping full control of that within IT's domain. But we're also aware that uh, it's not always possible to centralize the access to that, those applications and data. So when data does need to be mobilized and distributed, then we'll be looking to containerize that mobile data in a secure container on those devices to, to enable that offline yet secure use. By deploying context-aware policies, it gives us an IT greater control over who accesses and how they access that data as we can not only look at who the user is and if, if it's a trusted 
user within the organization, but what device they're accessing on, the location they're coming in from, and the network connection. So we can see that although they may be a trusted user, perhaps they're coming in from an untrusted device. And we may want to either uh, remove access or limit the type of data in the access. And then through the use of analytics, um, we can give greater visibility on user behavior to detect potential threats and uh, flag these up uh, to IT as um, potential risks to the organization and, and try and pro proactively remediate uh, data breaches before they've happened by using machine learning. So let's look at um, a quick lower of how Citrix Security Solutions can support GDPR. So when we look across our security solution, when we look across our product portfolio uh, and the features that are provided, uh, they're based on tenets of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So in, when we're looking at security, we want the data to be confidential, only the right people have access to it. The data has to be uh, have integrity, so no cha unauthorized changes are made to it. And the data has to be available. So that it's it's not it's available for use and for uh, processing. So we're looking at contextual access, network security, application security, data security, and analytics and insights. And under each pillar, we're looking at specific functionality that enable us to meet some of these GDPR uh, requirements. So let's go one by one. We'll cover each one specifically. Uh, so for moving from left to right. We're talking about access, contextual access, so providing access to this personal data. How do we ensure that only the right people have access to the data? And this involves uh, empowering organizations to secure access to applications and their data by implementing controls uh, such as multi-factor authentication. Also, uh, group-based and user-based access policies um, that complement these contextual controls. and that adapt access privileges dynamically uh, based on the user's device, mm -hmm. uh, their location, uh, and or the network on an application by application basis. So we're talking about authentication, authorization, and having this policy orchestration that uh, does this dynamically. When we're looking at uh, the network security, we're looking at providing encryption. So GDPR stipulates or calls for encryption of personal data that's in transit. So going over the network, uh, we're preventing data from being compromised as it travels over networks. We encrypt the communication between the endpoints and the centralized data. And organizations can allow uh, secure remote access to virtual applications and desktops for employees, such as contractors, um, as well as contractors and vendors and partners and other third parties. Now, once we look at the application level, we're looking at uh, securing the, the use of the application, so the isolation and protection of the data within that application. So to further strengthen the data protection, we're looking at providing comprehensive measures for the application and data security, including centralization, uh, containerization, and inspection and segmentation as well. So if you look at those three uh, bullets in their centralization, containerization, inspection. We're really diving into application access. So centralization looks at centralizing the applications in the data center. Containerizing or containerization containerizes the apps and data on mobile endpoints. And inspection looks at the data when we're accessing web applications. So uh, doing inspection of the requests and responses and so forth. Now, looking at the data itself, there's a very high correlation or connection between the apps and data. Very, they're very tied together. So when we're centralizing the apps, we also centralize the data. When we containerize the apps, we also containerize the data. When we look at doing sharing of data, we're looking at uh, providing the controls to IT and to the end user to share the data securely. So we're looking at built-in capabilities uh, such as information rights management for file sharing, being able to do auditing, being able to expire links, expire data uh, sharing um, after a certain time and so forth. 
And lastly, when we're looking at analytics and insights, we're looking at providing more visibility and control and giving the uh, organizations uh, the required ability to have records of processing your personal data. So Citrix Solutions provide visibility and auditability of user access to track exactly how and by whom uh, personal data has been accessed. And this is done by, by reporting on the movement of data from end to end between data center and the endpoint. And therefore, organizations can better meet the GDPR guidelines. So when we look at all of these uh, components together in a, from a solution standpoint, we're starting to look at a functionality uh, and an architecture that goes over uh, kind of looking at a, a creating a security architecture from end to end. So now we're going to look at the, the challenges that the GDPR brings from a technical aspect. We, we've talked about the challenge it, it brings to you and your organizations. Now we'll look from a technical aspect. So the high level architecture you're seeing now, it's no doubt something you're familiar with. In today's organizations, the hundreds, if not thousands, of disparate endpoints ranging from desktop PCs, laptops, including Windows and Mac, tablets and smartphones. These endpoints will have their own applications installed, meaning they're going to have their own data stored locally on the device. This is a big challenge when it comes to auditing and monitoring who is accessing what data on what device and for what purpose. Also, with regards to keeping data on devices, it becomes a massive challenge to safeguard that data, which is paramount when we're talking about the GDPR. Aside from the endpoints, there is also the back-end infrastructure. In order to provide users access to the applications and data they need to do their job, you'll often have various networking appliances to provide gateway, VPN, firewall, identity services. And this adds more complexity to securing access to data, it's also keeping a firm grip on monitoring who is accessing what from where. With such disparate systems and solutions, gaining valuable analytical data into these can often be troublesome. Summarize, what we end up with is application and data sprawl over a myriad of devices. Both corporate and personal data resided on mobile devices, which then becomes uh, a problem, not technically, but from a, a process point of view for IT to manage and control. And how can you safeguard your corporate, personal, identifiable data uh, and keep it separate from the, the personal data on those mobile devices? We also got complex access methods for staff and customers providing different user experiences depending on how they're accessing. And because of so many different uh, infrastructure and, and uh, solutions, we've got limited insight into that data. So what, what we want to look at is that the, uh, the Citrix architecture and the Citrix approach uh, to protecting data and protecting applications. Um, what we're looking at is compared to the previous slide, which really kind of visualizes the complexity uh, of traditional IT. And uh, we know with complexity, we have, uh, it's pretty much, it's the enemy of security, right? So when you have multiple systems that need to be managed, multiple systems that need to be patched, multiple systems that need to be audited and updated, uh, it becomes a, a game of whack-a-mole. And it's, it's, that's when, um, we get vulnerabilities and security incidents happen when there's just too many things to uh, to manage. So when we're looking at the Citrix infrastructure, we're looking at the endpoints here on the left side that are really the, the low value assets, right? So they're the low value assets that we have moved the high value information, high value data off of. And we've centralized that data into the data center uh, that's sitting behind a host of different, uh, not only technology for application delivery, but also a host of different uh, security technologies. We're talking about 
you know, the traditional perimeter firewalls, we're looking at IPSs, IDSs, we're looking at a number of infrastructure security uh, components that provide additional security functionality that you don't have to replicate on these endpoints that are, you know, running around different locations, jumping from different network, from different network, uh, potentially being on uh, VYOD or CYOD or on devices that are, are owned by the, by the employee. So we're moving high value applications and data off of those endpoints, centralizing in the data center. And that's pretty much the first step uh, is to centralize those applications, but then providing the access or providing the content aware policies to, to manage who accesses them, who accesses the applications and what, uh, when they have access, um, what are the parameters for these uh, for access? Maybe they can connect from home devices uh, and they get a limited access. Maybe they connect from BYOD, BYOD devices and they get uh, more access. And when they do access, they get access to these applications that have been centralized. So when we're looking at centralizing applications and data, we're looking at a better way to manage this data as well. So the key here is the data. So we're not having data sprawl, data that's sitting in a file on, a, on an endpoint that potentially gets lost or stolen or damaged or destroyed completely. So now you're talking about data availability as a, as a component there as well. Uh, so centralizing those apps and data. And then when you're looking at the apps, we're talking about uh, patch management as well. So the OS management, the application configuration is gonna be much more uh, consistent and streamlined than having, um, having those apps be uh, de deployed on these endpoints. And additionally, when we're looking at the mobile endpoints that have native applications on them, uh, we're looking at containerizing that data on the mobile device, but having central management, having uh, management of that of access to those uh, to those apps and data, as well as those devices when they connect back to their data repositories or data sources or additional uh, resources on the internal network, they'll connect through a secure device that gives the additional encryption, additional authentication and authorization to access um, the data sitting on the, uh, on the internal network. And lastly, we're looking at analytics and insights. And this is where the pow power of machine learning, the power of AI gives us the ability to look at providing a, a way of identifying risk at the user level uh, at the action level, at the behavior level, so the user behavior level. So we're looking at uh, identifying, for example, if a user connects from one location and then all of a sudden, 20 minutes later, they're connecting from an improbable location that's uh, a few thousand miles away, that sets up a red flag. Now let's look at uh, the security by looking at security at design um, from a perspective of building it to uh, the design of your architecture right so we have the concepts of security we have the concepts of of centralization and remote and cont uh, contextual access but when we look at designing a citrix environment we have the ability through the citrix solution of looking at the way that applications and data are classified and designing around not only performance and scalability, but designing around security. So for example, we have a, a Zen app server at the top that has a specific application that has very sensitive data, has very sensitive, um, it's a very sensitive application, but also has a data that is also very sensitive. So we wanna segment these applications away from uh, other applications that may have common data. Uh, so when we're looking at HR applications, when we're looking at financial applications, there are ways to design these environments uh, so that they're not flat networks, design these environments so that they're security zones and you know, potentially looking at virtual firewalls, hardware firewalls, having uh, network access control between uh, these servers in your farm so that uh, there is no chance of you know, contamination from one server to the other server.
And I'll also cover containerization of mobile apps and data apps, right? So when we're looking at, as mentioned before, at these mobile devices that actually have the data installed on them, have the apps installed in the data as well in their databases, uh, we're looking at providing an additional layer of encryption. It's an additional layer of, of access required to, uh, to get access to these applications and the data and giving IT the ability to say, if a device is lo lost or stolen, to wipe a specific application off or wipe specific data, wipe data that is uh, shared uh, from that device and restore going further and restoring a, a device to a factory, um, factory state. So let's take a look at the summary of the Citrix solution and where each plays, each part of the, part of the portfolio plays. So Zen App and Zen Desktop are about apps and data. So apps and data are essentially managed in the data center or the cloud and access via granular access control. And all these fall under the workspace suite as well. Uh, when we're looking at Citrix NetScaler, it's about access and control across the network with the ability to provide a sure app delivery. So that's the availability component, making sure the systems are up for, for access and the end-to-end -end visibility. When we're looking at mobile apps and data, Zen Mobile provides that secure apps uh, secure access to the mobile apps, as well as our own secure uh, product productivity suite of apps. And then ShareFile provides the data access, the storage and the sharing, and can be controlled. Uh, they're either on-prem or in the cloud and gives ITV control and audit auditing capability. So Thanks. Stephen, can you summarize these for us? So in summary, the approach that Citrix takes in order to aid our customers in their GDPR journey centers on these four key points. So we're looking to centralize apps and data within corporately owned assets, data center, or cloud, greater control. Where we need to mobilize that data, then we're looking to securely containerize that data for offline usage on mobile devices. Also looking at deploying context-aware policies to give IT more granular control over how users access that data and from where. Having greater analytics and hence insight into who's accessing that data and how they're using it. Let's perhaps the next steps. I recommend that you understand what data is being collected and why. And one of the principles of GDPR is to see about minimizing data. So do you really need to have all of that data? The less data you've got, then the less risk. And doing a, uh, an audit of what data you've got to fully understand uh, if that is, is sensitive data. Make sure you're securing consent when needed. So consent to capture the data on an ind individual, maybe through privacy notice, or some type of a consent acceptance. Also adopt uh, secure data handling practices. We, we've spoken about how Citrix solutions can help with this and how a privacy by design approach is encouraged. Also there's how third parties you know, adopt secure data handling practice. So if you're having to pass on that information under your control to a, a third party, making sure that they can also guarantee the uh, secure transfer and access of that data. Also developing a data breach response plan. So it's best to plan for the worst. So, so that when it happens, you know, you've got a plan in place. You know exactly who you need to uh, speak to, the, the authorities you need to notice, and, in, and if uh, applicable, the individuals themselves depending on that data breach. So having a plan is going to allow you to uh, face that situation with a lot more, lot more confidence. And finally, you know, make sure you select technology vendors that can support you in your GDPR readiness and along that journey. We do have a link that you can browse to. 
It's www.citrix.com slash GDPR. And on it, you'll have access to multiple blogs that have been written by both technical and business leaders at Citrix, as well as a, uh, a white paper that goes into more depth about uh, all the, the solution and the functionality that we provide uh, to help you meet and to achieve your uh, GDPR guidelines uh, requirements. And with that, I believe we're going to go start our Q&A. Paul? All right. Thank you very much, guys. Um, now we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A session. Um, I would like to remind our audience that if you have a question for our speakers, you can submit it in the Ask a Question area on your screen. Simply type the question into the text box, and you can hit Submit. And joining us for our Q&A session, um, we have Oliver Kirshna, who is also a, is a senior director uh, for our Citrix legal team in EMEA. So thanks, Oliver, for joining us for this segment. Um, we're going to go ahead and look at the questions now. And again, um, please enter them as, you, uh, as we go along here. I'm going to start out with this question here. Um, First question, if my company is not headquartered in the EU, do we need to follow the GDPR? Um, yes, hello everyone, this is Oliver. I can answer that one. The answer is uh, clearly yes. So no matter where a headquarter is, if a company has a subsidiary, a branch office, a rep office, whatever in the EU, it's subject to GDPR. But even if a company is completely based outside of the European Union, as long as it has customers in the European Union or if it processes data of data subjects, so individuals uh, in the European Union, it is subject to the GDPR. So in the end, it's practically applicable for everybody um, who, who is doing business um, on, on, on a global basis, right, or across countries, including European countries. Thanks, Oliver. Okay. Um, go to the next question now. Let's see here. Um, next question, are there context-aware policies you discussed today available? Hi, it's Stephen here. Uh, yes, so all, all of the context-aware policies that we've discussed in the webinar today are available in all our versions of Citrix Netscaler. And then they also tie in with the use of Zenapple Zen Desktop. Very good, thanks, Stephen. Uh, next question, um, does GDPR have any special security or hosting requirements for medical records? Um, great question. So in, in general, the GDPR has the principle that a lot of the obligations depend on how sensitive the data is and how um, severe the impact is if there is a data breach or a violation of, of the law. So the more sensitive a data is, um, the better security measures should be and the better documentation has to be. Um, and there is even a defined category of sensitive data uh, for which special regulations apply. And healthcare data is obviously um, highly sensitive uh, data, um, so that there are special requirements, yes. Thanks, Oliver. Um, okay, next question. Let's see here. Uh, next question. Um, we're continually under attack from ransomware, malware, and other threats. How can Citrix help us? I'll take that one, Paul. Uh, so yeah, as um, organizations, we're under attack from uh, all these different types of uh, of malware and 
you know, we're going to be held accountable for safeguarding our customers' data, whether it's from, um, you know, leakage or uh, exposure or even destruction in the case of some things like malware so, or ransomware specifically. Uh, so when we're looking at how can Citrix help, uh, we're, we build this environment that is, uh, provides a, a barrier or um, a segmentation away from, from uh, different malware. So if you start looking at some, some of the other um, regulations that are happening around the world that are not, a, not specific to GDPR, but we're looking at things like internet separation, uh, separating the applications that are running uh, away from direct internet access, uh, so that you're not so uh, susceptible to getting malware and ransomware assigned, uh, located or downloaded and infecting those machines. So it's about building a security architecture that protects, protects those applications and data uh, and segments them away from direct internet access. Thanks, Warren. Appreciate that. Uh, next question here we have, um, we're looking at a cloud first strategy. Are all the capabilities Citrix has talked about today available in Citrix cloud? Hi, it's Stephen. Yeah, I'll, I can answer that. So um, with Citrix cloud, so what, so what we've seen today with our with our products and with Citrix being a cloud first organization, most of what we've talked about today is available directly through Citrix Cloud as a, as a complete cloud based service to our customers. Um, but there are a few exceptions around some of the NetScaler piece. Um, and in uh, this scenario, what we would uh, look at and and highly recommend is actually a hybrid cloud approach. So we would uh, a, a customer looking to um, roll out something that's been described today by myself and Florin would be looking to get pretty much most of those services via our cloud service, and then there would be an element of the NetScaler side of things. So those context-aware policies, uh, if you wanted to deploy. Um, or any uh, additional authentication methods. Um, we would be looking at um, uh, those services coming from either your data center or your service provider data center as it stands today. So uh, uh, hopefully that's answered the question. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate that. Uh, next question we have here. Um, as an IT infrastructure provider, who is responsible at the end that the solution is GDPR compliant? Is it the provider or the customer? Yes, this, this is Oliver again. So great question. Um, under the old EU data protection directive, it was always just the customer who was responsible. And that's, in fact, one of the main changes with the new regulation with GDPR, that now both the data controller and the data uh, processor are responsible. Um, so this means towards a data subject, an individual whose data is processed, or towards the data protection authorities, both are responsible, and then it will be up to the parties to agree contractually um, who between them is responsible for someone. So usually it will depend on um, whose fault it is if something went wrong. Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate that. Next question. Um, is there a GDPR requirement that the latest security patches have to be applied? All right, so that's a, that's a great question there, uh, Paul. So uh, there isn't a specific requirement uh, that uh, specifically says up-to-date patches, uh, but there is in, I believe, Article 32, um, a, a section around following industry best practices and 
having up-to-date technologies. And this is where a lot of the, uh, the onus of being up-to-date on technology and having a sound security infrastructure uh, falls under. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, there's no specific guideline a, around uh, you know, bullet points of having specific technology, but there is an onus of having uh, following best industry practices. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate that. All right, next question. Um, does the GDPR require that all data has to be stored and processed in the EU? Uh, yes, that, that's actually one of my favorite questions. We, we hear this quite a lot, and you will also find this uh, on the Internet. Um, by the way, this is Oliver speaking, I think, even if the screen shows now Stephen. Um, so you will find this information that this is a requirement. This is one of the common myths around um, about GDPR. The answer is clearly no. There is no requirement to have all data stored or processed in the EU. Like under the current data protection laws, there are some requirements if data is processed outside of the EU. Um, it needs to be made sure that there is an adequate level of data protection, either by so-called model clause agreements, so by some sort of agreements that ensure the same level of uh, data protection, or between the US and the EU that a company is um, EU Privacy Shield certified, like, uh, for example, Citrix is. Oh, great. Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate answering that one for me. Uh, next one here. Uh, how can Citrix help me add additional authentication options for access to my data? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. When we're looking at protecting uh, data and, and protecting access to those applications that use the data, um, I would say the um, the minimum effort there should be implementing technologies such as two-factor authentication. So with, uh, with NetScaler, when you're connecting either remotely or within the environment and accessing these applications or whoever connects, um, they should have a second factor of authentication that is uh, independent of their domain credentials or whatever credentials are being used. And um, so on top of that, there's other uh, functionalities um, that we can use. Uh, we could be uh, end user certificates or uh, device certificates to, to look at the device and see whether it's a managed device. So when you, you're working with applications that deal with customers' personal data and you want to limit access to these applications, uh, it's usually a better idea to have multiple levels of these authentications. Um, Two-factor authentication certificates, uh, you can start even looking at where they're connecting from whether they're connecting from certain IP addresses, certain geographical areas, certain countries. Uh, maybe you have a, a list of, of uh, countries where nobody is, about, nobody is normally coming from that area. You just block those off as well. Um, and those are available within, within the NetScaler. Perfect. Thanks, Warren. Appreciate that. Um, we're coming up on the end here soon. Um, I do have one here. Uh, it's, it's unique. It says, is Citrix compliant with GDPR? Um, I, I can answer this one. This is Oliver. Um, so we will be ready and GDPR compliant on May 25th in 2018. So this is really the big date. GDPR becomes effective um, on the 25th of May next year. That's when all companies have to be compliant. So um, I think uh, most companies will not be ready yet, but we, like probably many companies, are in the middle of our GDPR readiness project. Uh, we have started the effort quite some time ago and have um, a dedicated Tiger team working on that to be ready next year, May, 
which is really the big date when all the companies have to be ready. And the good thing is a lot of the requirements in GDPR are not completely new and some are reflected in current data protection laws. So if a company has a robust data protection program already today and takes data privacy, data security, um, and, and security of their customers serious, then it will be easier to become GDPR ready and uh, close any potential gaps. Thanks, Oliver. Um, we did have one that just came in, and maybe it's um, either you or Foreign or one of you guys can ask. Um, uh, customer wants to know, uh, when is it going to affect North America? I, I think I could add this to, to the answer of the previous question. So I think at the latest on the 25th of May 2018, because then it is the time when the regulation becomes effective um, and when uh, the, the, the heavy fines could apply in case of a breach. Um, so this is when also companies um, in North America should be ready. Um, and that means preparation should, of course, start before that date uh, to, to be ready then. Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate you following up on that one. Um, we do have a couple here that are asking about um, uh, GDR fulfillment gu uh, guidelines or guarantee. Uh, how, how do you, is there some kind of periodic reporting to guarantee fulfillment? Um, does anybody want to comment on that one? I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. Sure, I, I, I can take that one as well. Um, it's like, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as simple to get some sort of uh, certification and uh, a stamp GDPR compliant by an authority, so it will be the responsibilities of the companies. But for a lot of the obligations um, in the GDPR, it will for sure help to have um, regular uh, reports or certifications and there are also ongoing obligations to review, test and, and, and audit the, the own security measures. Um, so that is part of the security system that, that has to be set up. And there are also some um, articles in the GDPR about setting up um, a code of conduct, um, w w which is also a kind of a certification framework, um, but it's still not clear how this will look like and what kind of standards will be acknowledged by the authorities. So um, that, that is not finally decided yet. But definitely periodic reports um, will, will be part of uh, becoming GDPR compliant to be able to show that one is compliant. Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate you um, helping clear that up a little bit. Um, okay, that is all the questions that we have. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Um, first, I want to thank our panel of experts, Florence, Stephen, and Oliver, for joining us and presenting to us. It was a lot of great information here, and we, it was very educational. Appreciate your time, guys. And of course, we want to thank our audience for taking the time to join us. Um, we appreciate you uh, always, and uh, we hope everybody has a great day. Take care.